Um, so yeah, so hello, I guess, to the recording. I'm Kira, uh, software developer. And I guess, yeah, we'll just do a couple quick, basically announcements. Um, so Ethan and Daniel and a few other people and myself have been talking about um, ways to get a sort of recurring workshop series kind of going with Cyclos probably about once a month. Um, and so I don't know if anyone was around or remembers their uh, sort of Hanami workshop that I did about like a few months ago in December or something like that. Um, we're thinking of kind of updating and, and changing that one a little bit and sort of rerunning it in probably May. So I guess that's that's one announcement. There will be a Hanami workshop coming up sometime in like the next couple months. Um, and we were thinking it'll be similar to the last one. We'll go over kind of the basics and, and what Hanami is, but we're thinking maybe more uh, focusing on some of the ways that Hanami can um, kind of help you like extract common patterns and like minimize the amount of code that it takes to make like repetitive visualizations. So last time it was more kind of just on building different different kinds of graphs and whatever. Um, so, uh, sorry, very distracted. Um, <laughs> so yeah, anyway, that's, that's roughly the idea for the upcoming Hanami workshop. And I think Rohit, you're gonna rerun one as well, or is it, maybe it's an entirely new one. I don't know if you want to say something about that. And that's that's coming up sooner, I think, in, in April. Yeah, it's coming up in a week, I think. It's coming on. Oh, man. Okay, that's really soon. Third. So yeah, so why don't you go ahead and say a few words about that? Um, okay. So the I, I ran this workshop about statistics, uh, like basic measures of statistical inference in December. It seems like a long time ago. Uh, uh, for the reclosure conference, I'm probably it's going to be a rerun of the original workshop, but the workshop is about uh, the measures of statistical inference, which you know we use in like everyday testing of like experiments, uh, things such as p values and confidence intervals, uh, and powers of tests, like you know to see how effective they are. Um, so the only difference between like you know you know doing this in a traditional data science world which you know assumes that you know the math you understand distributions this uh, workshop is like you know if you can write loops if you can write like you know simple map reduce and filter code you can actually do basic statistics like you know you can be fairly powerful with what you can do so this just explains the measures of statistical inferences of statistical inference and then it also explains how you can do it in pure code uh, without like knowing any formula um, and it uses a technique called uh, you know the it's it's it, the randomization techniques called resampling so i'm taking up uh, these uh, examples from the book uh, statistics is easy by uh, if I don't know why the author's name skipped me, but you know, there's a book called Statistics is Easy. It's a small book about like synthesis lectures. And I'm just going to pick up ex the first two, three chapters of that book really in the workshop. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. I have this like little video cover thing. Um, so I think that's all that's like concretely planned for the upcoming workshops. Um, but uh, I think there's like maybe a couple more that are sort of more vaguely being talked about. And obviously, if anyone else has any ideas that you either want to teach or learn about, um, feel free to let any one of us know anytime. Um, there are a few people in the community who are like, like myself, like I, I love putting workshops together and, and teaching, but I don't write open source libraries or build the things that I teach about. So um, if you have like a cool library that you want to like teach or um, yeah, or if you want to run a workshop yourself, just sort of there, anyway, there's lots of opportunities to, to do that. So let someone know and uh, we'll make it happen. And I guess, I guess one thing I should mention is that this, it's not like a just like, here's a topic and go teach. Like we, we 
tend to do lots of like planning sessions as a group and there's lots of support and lots of opportunities to kind of meet up two or three or however many times you want before the workshop itself to like flush it out together um, or put it together uh, collaboratively. So there'll be a few of those meetings coming up as well um, that anyone's welcome to join uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. So anyway, um, I think that's about all I have to say about workshops unless you have anything else to add, Daniel. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe just that I think these workshops are very much supporting us as a group, which is trying to, to figure, figure out the current stack of libraries and where we're going, what is missing, what is more or less teachable. And I think it is, it is very much helping us in getting this sense of direction just having this experience of teaching and learning all the time. So I, I'm so much looking forward to uh, uh, Kira's and Rohit's workshops because last time I learned so much from them and they did bring this kind of clarity that we're looking for for many parts of the ecosystem. So I'm, I'm kind of happy to, to have them more uh, soon and have more clarity coming and yeah. Uh, it will be great. Great. Yeah, thanks so much, Daniel. And yeah, sorry, everyone. I know my connection is not great. I'm uh, I'm seeing what I can do about that. But um, yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, and I guess that's that's the point of the workshops is just to like, like this whole closure data science ecosystem is really exploding. Oh, man, I think I'm frozen. Sorry, one sec. No, uh, you're good. I think we can see you. Uh, yeah okay interesting it's frozen yeah. on my end anyway, um but yeah just there's just a lot of stuff going on right now in, in the data science closure community and so yeah it's just kind of you know exciting to like explore together and try to like maybe figure out how to like consolidate all the tools and like where everything fits in and and zero in on like a couple projects that everyone can use so anyway yeah so that's that's really cool i'm excited about it too um yeah so i guess yeah the next thing i don't know if you think it makes sense we could just go into oh i guess yeah for maybe talk about you know what everyone's doing with clerk or see if there's any questions that you want to talk about like in this during this hour hour and a half that we have left um otherwise we can go into the code but if anyone has any like thoughts i'm curious like how people are using clerk or what questions you have that kind of stuff or if you're using it at all, or if you're just here because you're like, what's clerk? So I've been using it for the workshop, Kira, and I'm not doing a good job of it, really. Like, you know, I'm just hand waving my way through stuff. But, you know, I, I like to see how people actually use it, like, you know, in the sense, like, you know, what, what's, a, what's a good workflow for something like clerk? Like, you know, you start up the REPL, you, you know, you make a couple of changes. Like, how do you, how do people, I, I want to see how people actually do like the really powerful stuff with Clerk. Like all these notebooks, right? Like you, you see that's the end goal of the system. Like you see the end product as people put out the notebooks. I don't know how they got there. Like, that's what I'm really interested in. Like, you know, what does this workflow look like to get from, you know, zero to wherever they are? Oh, sorry, I didn't unmute myself. Um, no, that's interesting. Yeah, and I'm sort of curious too, because yeah, I also, I don't use work clerk like professionally or anything, just for like my own little workshops and projects and stuff. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know if anyone is, but we can, we can at least make up a way to use it together. <laughs> but yeah, but that's cool. I don't know, anyone else have any thoughts? Um, I've been trying to use it for documentation at my company. Uh, oh, emphasis cool. on emphasis on trying because I can't get it to work, work on the repo, uh, on that repo for now. So okay, more, more, more when I have more to report. Sure, yeah. sure. Are there like specific like anything specific you you would want to like explore together to figure it out, or is it kind of just that's not wouldn't be helpful right now? Um, not sure. I don't I don't want to waste everyone's time because I I meant to ask at the clerk Slack channel in case they know. 
because uh, sure. it's like a generic error. So my, I might be just doing something really silly. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, maybe we can maybe we can check it out together. Cool. Yeah, I'm uh, completely new to Clerk, but I've been kind of following it, and it seems like there's a lot of really cool ideas that uh, um, Clerk embodies. And I'm also really interested in the evaluation model of basically the piece of the functionality between saving your namespace and producing all the values, kind of basically the piece in between uh, writing the code and visualizing it. Um, and then I'm also interested in kind of, um, I've been writing visualizations for the different um, data exploration tools. So I have one for reveal and one for portal. So I'd also like to be able to have that same plugin work in Clerk and see kind of across these tools what's the what might be in common. That's awesome. Yeah, that's super exciting. That's what, like one thing I'm really interested in is like how can we like yeah sort of consolidate some of the tools that are being built and like make you know basically like try to de dupe a lot of the work that's going on because there's so much it's happening so fast and there's so many different like you know ways to visualize stuff and all this like you know all these data science tools that people are building for their own needs but i think there's a lot of like stuff that we can maybe kind of you know steal from other projects and not have to do as much work basically which would be really cool um yeah anyway so so that sounds cool um is there anyone who wants to share their screen? Any volunteers? <laughs> you want to like dive in and just start exploring a bit? Or I'm happy to, but I don't know if I'm the, the best person for it. Um, I, I could share if you wish, uh, if you could uh, direct sure. me where to look and, or if anybody else wishes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, if that sounds good, I mean, sure. Yeah, that maybe if you want to share, we can we can watch Daniel. And we can try to figure out. Like, I guess I guess maybe also worth maybe before we start. Like, yeah. So what what should we like specifically look at right now? I think the um, like the common visualization plugins is a really interesting one. Um, or like Rohit's point about just seeing maybe different examples of notebooks and how people are using them. I don't know, uh, but yeah, where Daniel, if there's anything, I know you were like interested in the like caching and like lazy loading stuff. If you wanna like maybe look at some of that, I don't know. I think like my interest in the caching and the lazy loading is mainly because we're doing the workshop demos and you know the caching and the lady lazy loading actually gets in the way of like you know doing something live right now it just gets in the way so or it feels like it you know I'm just not doing it right um, so that would be something I'd be really interested in sure Yeah, maybe uh, I just comment about a chat we had uh, offline. Uh, Roy and I were kind of thinking about this common problem where maybe we are not grasping the idea completely. Maybe we are not flowing with the, the clerk way yet. And we are looking for something which is, let us call it the old way, which is just evaluating on demand and just getting the view. and what i'm practicing these days is doing that just getting the view of the current form uh, alongside clerk without without losing the ability to use clerk fully and and so it is kind of not using it the right way but i think it has been useful uh, for me and i'm i'm that is why i'm kind of curious about the internals about how we could use clerk in new ways if it makes sense um, so to me, anything that looks inside would be so interesting. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, maybe maybe we could do that. Yeah, if you want to like maybe screen share. Maybe, yeah, maybe we could start with like, yeah, like an example of where like a problem that, you know, that is being caused and we suspect it's because of we're not using the cache right or something like that. And then 
just kind of dive in and see what we can find out if that makes sense because yeah i agree with you rohita it is annoying when you're like trying to present something and then like yeah whatever the page doesn't reload or you have to like bust the cache manually or restart the whole thing or something like that it's very clunky so but yeah i, I suspect it's probably because i'm like using it wrong or something so yeah that's that sounds, my guess that sounds too. Cool. that's exactly what my guess is i'm just doing it wrong <laughs> like the tool is far too powerful for me to be you know like it looks i mean amazing. we'll see yeah we'll but see I'm, it's a new it's yeah. a new library it's a new project but you never know oh there's ethan hey yeah so Hey, Ethan. We were uh, just about to start looking at probably Daniel's screen. Um, we're talking about the cache, the in clerk, sometimes not behaving the way we expect. And we're going to maybe like try to, you know, reproduce the problem and then just mm -hmm. kind of try to dive in and see if there's some way to. I don't know, use the tool differently or fix that or something. I guess that's, it might be related to that whole, like like you were saying, Adrian, the like evaluation process, like whatever's going on between that saving and refreshing the browser step, something's going wrong in there maybe, I don't know. Sounds good. Yeah, I think I, I've like, it sounds like something I've experienced when playing around with Clerk, but I haven't played around enough yet to, Sort of be certain of the patterns. <laughs> so I'll just watch. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's part of the thing is that like it's such a new, it's a new tool, it's a new library. Like, and I don't know if anyone is really using it like on a large scale professionally. So everyone's kind of has this feeling of like, am I using this right? I don't really know. I'm pretty sure I'm doing something wrong, but I'm not sure if it's broken because I'm doing it wrong or because it's just broken. But, and there's no like canonical, like, you know, big company to refer to about like how to do it right or whatever. So we're all kind of just <laughs> dealing with it. But anyway, yeah, but anyway, that's why we're here. So hopefully we can figure something out. Cause yeah, I do think it's a really useful, it's a really useful tool and I'd love to see it, you know, become, become really popular. Yeah. So we'll see. Mm. Yeah. Um, so maybe should I share my screen? Yeah, I think that sounds yeah. good. Go ahead. Yeah, great. So um, uh, uh, sharing a moment. Mm. Oh, sorry. Um, Maybe maybe what I'll share is um, just just before we, we begin looking, I I want to kind of respond to something that Rohit said and and uh, share my current use of Clerk, if it makes sense, and and which is probably what we called doing it the wrong way or what I I think I might be doing, uh, I I think. Can you see my screen? Uh, I think you do, right? You, you can. Uh, so you see the editor and the browser, right? And I have a tiny namespace here. And uh, this is one of those two visual tools experiments we're doing at the visual tools group, uh, trying to play with these things and use them the wrong way. And uh, what we have now, um, uh, I guess, uh, we have clerk serving uh, as usual, and we could um, we could do the usual clerk rendering of the whole notebook, right? And but we could use it in another mode where whenever we evaluate something, we already get it on demand, as Rohit uh, called it. 
So we could get this number and this, this image and, and a data set and, uh, and a plot, right? And a, a, a hiccup block with a few plots and, and things like that. So that is what I'm doing at work at the moment, doing it wrong in, the, in this sense, right? And it is, it is kind of uh, nice in this sense where we are not losing the ability to render the whole namespace whenever we like as we did now, right? So, so that is what I'm curious about, finding those patterns that allow us to keep this dynamic way that some of us are kind of like, if it makes sense. And, and maybe that is something that we could discuss on some of the future meetings, because now we are just about learning clerk, right? And so what I'll share now is the clerk repo, and we will dive into the code, right? Uh, does it make sense? Um, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Uh, here is uh, here is the screen again, and here we have the clerk repo, and uh, right. So, so. Uh, here's the, the source code and, and we will start the REPL. And may, maybe should I make the font bigger? Uh, uh, it's not too bad on my screen, but I don't know. I guess it probably depends how how big everyone else's screens are. I guess it's a little small. Oh, yeah. Sorry for this. Sorry, yeah, great. So, so here's the, the clerk source code, right? The main API namespace. And, and I guess what we could do maybe is try to overview what we're seeing in the different namespaces and, and, and uh, uh, kind of see where we wish to look further, right? Oh, and, and I have some of these here that I should remove, just my experiments that do not belong here. And yeah. Um, so uh, uh, did we pick a question or should we just overview what, what whatever we're seeing, like look it in, look into it as a full stack project and, and see how it works, where is the web server and how we are accessing the client side and, what happens when we call the main API functions? Would, would it make sense if we kind of dive in into the main, main entry points and try to understand them? Uh, what, what do you think? Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, maybe, we, yeah, we could just start with like what happens when you, when you save, I guess, or something, I don't know, or wherever you want. Yeah, great. Great. So, um, try to follow the path through the through the cache to the browser somehow. <laughs> mm, yeah, fantastic. So, right. So here is the, the main namespace, and I think uh, there is this function clerk show, right? Which is, um, I think, what uh, clerk is currently encouraging us to use as a main entry point, and it has this idea of defining uh, some hotkey in your editor that would just call this function over the file you're currently editing. And I think that is also, I think that the, the response to, I mean, the, the response to autosave is similar to this one, if I remember, remember correctly. But I think this one is the, like the main entry point they are encouraging nowadays. And so should we look inside and see uh, what is happening? Um, so, right, so we are taking a file, right? We could maybe, uh, yeah, may maybe let us uh, first start the server. Um, so we are serving a uh, clerk and, oh, oh, do we have the record? Yeah, we have. 
sorry. Right, so now we have it serving and 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 then we can call this clerk show function over a file, right? So for example, yeah, this one would um, give us this file, this this uh, rendered notebook, right? So so we're curious about this clerk clerk show function. Oh. So here is this show function. So what is happening? Um, so I don't know what is that. Maybe I'm kind of skipping this uh, setup detail. And then, okay, so we are remembering the, the last file and, and then we are passing it, right? We are passing the file. Should we try and see what happens if we pass a file? So uh, let us uh, try to pass file. Uh, right? Like what happens if we pass this one? Oh, so, typo. Oh, thank you. It's because we're oh. watching. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Pass file. Yeah, so it is returning something. So that is what we got after passing the file. And so we got some representation of a closure file with some, with I guess the comments assumed to be blocks of markdown, right? And probably everything else is assumed to be code, right? And and this block is known to be the namespace definition block, right? And so that is what we're getting from passing the file. And then we have some additional information like the title. And so let us look in the source. So this is the title, maybe because I, I'm not sure why it is recognized as the title for some reason, right? And there is this table of contents, which maybe we shouldn't, kind of figure out at the moment. I'm not sure if it is so important. Anyway, that is passing a file, right? Is it, uh, am I doing it kind of okay? Like uh, trying to look and see what is happening. Uh, so should we look and see how it happens passing the file? Uh, so pass file, I'm jumping to the function definitions and, and then, uh, Oh, so if it is a closure file, then this is the relevant function, I guess. Pass closure oh. string. I didn't Sorry? know you. I didn't know you could just give clerk like straight up markdown files. That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't know too. Yeah, yeah. So we can. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so if it is not a markdown file, then we are jumping to this one, which is passing a closure string. And, and here we have complexity, right? But what, what is passing actually? What, what, what is, where is the passing happening? So, um, P pass, what is this P namespace? Okay, so we are in this library, this rewrite CLJ library. That is the, the technology used by Clerk for passing. Um, so maybe maybe we shouldn't look further now because this will kind of uh, require learning about rewrite CLJ, which is, uh, to me, it is always a bit complicated. And, but right, so, so we have this part of the logic, which is, we see not so small because it relies on this sophisticated library and also some logic of recognizing blocks and probably collecting common comments together as markdown blocks and all that. And it looks like it is happening here, right? So maybe we should skip it. Is it, is it good to kind of skip and, and go further now? To... Uh, can you just talk about what, what's, uh, it sounds like you're familiar with rewrite CLJ. It's just for, it's like a library for parsing closure code in different ways that the, and then re, restructuring it. 
Is yes. That the idea? Yeah, yeah, and it is it is very detailed in uh -huh. in the way it uh, it represents the the code as a data structure, the past mm -hmm. code, and also in the way it allows to navigate and transform this structure. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when I needed something like that, it looked to me uh, much more than I needed. Uh -huh. And I used an easier, just smaller library called Parsera, uh, which oh. is just about passing the code to just a tiny data structure. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and but rewrite CLJ is this project that is shared by many tools, I mm -hmm. think, and also a very much um, a kind of uh, developed by a large group of people who are contributing and thinking about it together. So uh -huh. it is like a serious piece of technology, as far as I understand. And and maybe somebody else knows more about it here. Uh, but yeah, that, I, yeah. So re rewrite CLJ kind of um, it parse. So closure is a superset of Eden, and so uh -huh. there's like things like reader conditionals and comments and um, other forms that if you just read Eden get lost. And so rewrite CLJ lets you deal with those. So it's really about parsing code. It gives you the AST and you can edit the AST as if it were data. But the big win with rewrite CLJ is that it also um, preserves white space. So uh -huh. if you're trying to update code and you want to do some refactoring, you don't necessarily want it to mess up all of your um, for formatting. So if you wanted mm -hmm. to like, you know, take a snippet inside a function and make it its own function, you want to preserve all the white space uh -huh. um, in the function that you're editing and kind of play nice with making it look like some somebody actually wrote that code. Uh -huh. So um, yeah, so it's really useful for those sorts of things where you actually want to edit code and not just eat in like I get the white space is important. Thank you very much. It's helpful. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, do you use it, by the way? I've used it in a few cases. Um, yeah, I'm not a super user, but I have uh, found it useful for specific things. Yeah. Mm, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And so uh, here we are. Uh, oh. Uh, here we are um, back with our uh, passing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, right, so that is the data structure that we got. And it looks like at this stage, it only divided the code into blocks, right? It is not passing the code yet, right? Not turning it into a data structure or where each top level form is converted to some closure structure. It is still a string, right? So yeah, so maybe we should uh, read further. So um, that is what happened when we passed the file. And now we got this thing that we called doc, which is the structure that we just created. And now we are kind of destructuring it and uh, oh no, sorry. Now we are looking at our state, right? What is this thing? Uh, it is probably an atom because we have this dereference sign. So I'm jumping to this, right? So it is an atom, which is probably some of our current state, maybe the main part. And, and we are picking this mapping of blob to result. That is, if I understand correctly, the cache, I think. The mapping from a certain uh, ID to a value uh, of previous evaluations. So that is one thing we are looking into. And another thing is, let us see. So, oh, so now we are evaluating, right? So now we are evaluating this whole document that we read, this doc that 
is the result of parsing the file. Something that looks like that, right? So we are calling this, uh, sorry, we are calling this uh, eval results function over these two things. One is the mapping between ID to previous evaluation result. And the other is the current document, the current file we were passing. So here some evaluation activity is going to happen probably. And maybe in a moment we'll dive in. Is it making sense? It is a guess, I think, uh, that of what might be. Right, and I guess it makes sense from what we know about Clerk that evaluation is uh, minded to previous caching, right? So, so. Um, the, uh, what do we think that blob to result value is? Yeah, we're thinking, and in a moment, let us check. Mm -hmm. Actually, let us check, right? Let us see what it is. So um, I'll, I'll evaluate, I'll, sorry, I'll show this namespace once. So now we'll have it rendered in the clerk view. Right, so now this main clerk namespace is rendered. And now we have this state already and we can look inside. So now I'm looking inside this piece of state we have. And here is how it looks, this web server doc structure. It has many things inside. Ah. And one of them is this sub map, mm -hmm. which is a mapping from blob from ID to result. So for example, this ID is mapped to this result, which is the result of evaluating something which turned out to be nil. Right? What is that ID? What is that ID? It's a hash. Is it is it is it just where's that generated? We don't know yet. Don't know yet. But but it, yeah. it, it it's identifying a block. Is that what we think? Yes. Or that uh, uh, I sorry, identifying a certain value that has been evaluated. A a has value. been an evaluation result in the past. Uh-huh. I see. And then and and we expect that, that ID, <clears throat> I mean that ID has to remain constant because otherwise this wouldn't work as a cache. Is that it's not like deterministic or sort of a result of the the value like a hash of the value or something uh we don't know yet but i yeah we don't know yet okay yeah um so so yeah so if we are looking inside maybe we should look further inside if we are already looking into the state of clerk which is it looks like that is what it is right this web server doc structure so we see that it has some some general information about um... actually one more yeah. can we what from what we know so far yeah uh, how does what do we think is happening with cash when we save it, it, when we when we it, it's not generated yet or if we haven't saved at all, there's no, there's nothing there. But when we save, we expect that this, we get, we have this value. And then when we save again, we think it's probably caching, or sorry, checking to see if there's a hit. So I Cache. think, um, I think both saving and explicitly show calling the show function right. would bring us here. Mm -hmm. to eval results uh -huh. and that is probably the main piece of logic that we have to look into in a moment and what we think it is doing is somehow being clever and evaluating only whatever change. does need yeah whatever change whatever is not cached yet uh, and, and just one more question is the do we you, you said we think that we get here. That means essentially the show method is like the main, wh whether you're saving or not, it's going through show. I uh, think so. But in any case, that is 
the current main entry point that they are encouraging. The okay. hotkey that they, they uh, use, uh, they have this Emacs config, it is pointing there to oh, okay. actually calling show with your current file. Oh, I see, okay. And, um, and so, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're helping me so much, kind of uh, not, not getting lost. Thank you for this. Uh, so, uh, hey, uh... I did watch some, I think I watched one video about where he kind of explains a little bit about how the evaluation is done and the caching. So what I think I remember was that uh, it parses the file, it gets the AST, it looks all the, it tracks all the individual expressions and it, um, at the expression level, it will um, create all the dependencies. And so I think what it does is that it can actually, like if you have, a call that calls something that uses the result from another expression, from another expression. Um, it can actually track those individual expressions. And then if it hasn't changed, it reuses the result. Otherwise, it, uh, if it has changed, it computes a new result in addition to all the dependencies of that um, expression. So a dependency on an, a value in, in another block, for example, is what you're Yeah, thinking. I'm not sure. I, if it tracks dependencies across like top level forms, but it seems like at least within a form, mm. it will do um, some amount of caching. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, yeah, I seem to remember that it wasn't just, you know, um, that it was by expression and not necessarily by kind of like line of code or it wasn't by text necessarily. Yeah, that is great. And yeah, and, and what it means, the, the, the fact that uh, it is trying to use the cache in a smart way mm -hmm. that is taking dependencies into account. What it means is that probably these, these hash, these I, hash values, these IDs, they need to somehow represent mm. uh, these dependencies. And, and we, we had, I don't know how, right? We haven't learned it yet, at least in this. Uh, maybe somebody here knows, but I, I, I don't know how they're generated, right? Um, yeah, so anyway, I think we saw this call to a function that does probably most of what uh, Adrian was telling uh, uh, based on the current cache and the currently passed document. And Maybe in a moment we'll dive in, but probably it is going to be a big part of the story. So maybe we should see what happens afterwards, just so that we have a mm -hmm. complete picture. Uh, so we got the result of this, right? And also got like how much time it took, but mm -hmm. result is the main thing. And what would we do with the result? We are updating the doc of, of the web server, right? So probably this update doc would update our state, right? So, so maybe, right, it looks like we have two things to learn. One is what happens in this eval call, and the other is what happens in this updating of the doc. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we look into the second one because probably it is the kind of the, the easier just to get an idea so that we could go back to the eval later. Is it good? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let us look into update doc and, oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, hmm. Yeah, so here we jumped into the web, oh, sorry, the web server namespace and where is it? Up. Update doc. Great. So that is what we were calling with our result of evaluation, right? And so our result is the, probably the new state, or at least the some step in preparing the new state. And then what is happening? Uh, Probably we are marking that we didn't, we did not get an error. 
probably that is what this step means, I'm guessing. And now we are calling broadcast. Well, yeah, let us, so a few steps are happening. First, we are resetting our state to the dark, to the result of evaluation, right? This um, dark var uh, is, sorry, this dark value is the result of our evaluation that we were passing here, right? This is this result. And now we are taking that and making that the new state, right? And then what are we doing? We are taking the currently new state, the new state and somehow calling this doc to viewer uh, function to kind of probably decorate it with all the information needed to actually view this thing. So here is where the viewers are getting into play, right? And then we are bro broadcasting it, which means probably passing it to the clients, to the browser. So, so we have two more functions to learn, right? This, which is decorating everything with viewer information, and this, which is broadcasting. Maybe let us look into broadcast because it is probably the easiest, I'm hoping. Sorry. So Daniel, one of the things I did notice, like, you know, when I was trying to make my workshop was that I, I just saw this, you know, it catches an exception and throws an error. So like, you know, as you're doing an interactive workshop, like, you know, and you make errors while you're writing code and you happen to save it, it basically takes away the whole screen. And I see now why it does that. But, you know, that was one of the things that, oh. you know, that uh, basically like, you know, I, I'm not, very good at it like you know i make mistakes when i type i make syntax errors and it takes away the whole page uh because i made that error um, and save yeah it. yeah let us let us try that so maybe i should insert an error right like this thing should give us an error and then i'll try to show the current file right and that is what we get, right? Right. The, the view of an error, right. right. And where did that happen? Probably inside the eval. I'm guessing, I'm guessing we did not get to update doc, but rather somewhere failed here. And not only uh, throw an exception, but also updated the view so that it knows to show this oh, message, right? Yeah, I can see the catch there where it says show error. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, yeah, so it is here, thank you. Yeah, so yeah, let us look actually. So uh, show error, great. So it is just broadcasting another thing and also resetting the state of the error to be that error. Yeah, it is starting to make sense, right? Yeah, and 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 thank you for coming. You know, I'm I'm kind of too too much used to ignoring the try catch parts, which is uh, this habit. Yeah, so that is what was happening. Great. Yeah. So, uh, oh, I didn't save, so I'm saving now and evaluating. And yeah, it is clear again. Great. So. So should we recap what whatever we were seeing so far? Um, so we were passing our file and getting a data structure, which is not a detailed passing, just dividing, dividing it into blocks of code. We were fetching the current cache from our state we were evaluating everything that is need that needs reevaluation and we didn't learn how we were getting a, re a result and then updating the state with the result and also broadcasting as we saw here inside broadcasting 
a decorated version of that to the clients, right? So that is what we were having. And now maybe we should dive in into one of these. So I think we had at least three things we're curious about. One is the evaluation, which is probably the biggest one. Another one is the, this decoration with viewers that takes the viewer information into account. And another one is broadcasting to the clients, right? Is it making sense? Is it good? Mm. Yeah, so, so which one should we pick? Well, well, should we look further? Maybe the broadcast would be the, the easiest. So, okay, so it is just broadcasting the, the whole document as Eden to the clients. Actually, let us, let us um, spit this into a file so that we can see, right? Th that is something that I'm, I'm sometimes, that I sometimes do when I, uh, when I want to see what was happening. So, so let us see what, have, what is being broadcast to the client. So I'll now uh, ask Clerk to show this namespace, to, to show this file. Oh, split ah, so message. So we did get this view of this file, right? And what did we get in this message.eden file? So that is the information we were passing to all clients, to all browsers which are listening. So maybe we'll do some pretty printing of that. Right. So that is the information that is being passed to the browser. So we see it has the values and the viewers, and maybe this case is not so interesting because we don't have any interesting viewers here, right? So, so it is can we talk about what the viewer is? No, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, but in, in uh, general, uh, yeah. yeah. But but the viewers, I think, they are something which is uh, kind of known on the user side. It is this idea that clerk can view things in different ways that the user can pick, and hmm. and right. So when it, whenever, yeah. Actually, let us look into a clerk namespace, uh, like, like a, a notebook. Uh, that is uh, typical, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, I'm not in the right place. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so here is a typical user side namespace of, of Clerk. Well, yeah, maybe it is, yeah, maybe not the best example. Uh, uh, yeah, here is the, the Vega one, right? So, so this is a notebook with some Vega plot. And what is this thing, this call to VVL? It is, uh, creating a data structure that has this additional information saying this thing uh, does not only have a value to be viewed, but also a, a viewer that the user can pick, right? So, um, so that is what viewers are about. Maybe another example. Uh, so this is kind of like your, there's some analogy here to the kind, the metadata used by NoteSpace. Um, yes. Except it's a different way of packing. Uh, 
this is actually defining a data special data structure that clerk deals with that includes a key value pair that specifies how the thing how the value will be inter rendered as opposed to node space which just dealt with a value and then that value might have had metadata attached to it so it read read it just a different way of packing that information along. Is that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And I think we are curious about these different ways. And, um, but uh, Clerk also has this support for use of metadata. And mm. yeah, may, maybe it is not the main pathway, so I'm not sure if we should discuss it now, but, um, but yes, it is the way of specifying how a thing should be viewed. Mm. And so here is maybe a more, a bigger namespace oh but it takes time to evaluate so maybe i should leave it yeah so actually i should shouldn't have taken uh this one uh yeah anyway uh yeah i, I stopped it because it was too too big um, that thing we were looking at before that was passed to the browser was that just a bunch of those structures with a value and a viewer yeah, let us go back. Here is this, uh, not here. Uh, yeah, actually, actually, I, I want to pick a good example so that we can see uh, in more detail. Okay. Uh, um, let us right because it will help us to, to kind of um, to find an, a good example where well, we we have viewers and um, I'm I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe this one. Right. So. So. Um, No, even though, no, it will bring up some other ideas that are kind of maybe uh, confusing. Sorry for this. Uh, yeah, the double pendulum, will it be slow? Will it be too slow? Maybe not so much. Yeah, so I'm... Oh, no, not this one, because it requires another thing. Um, yeah, many examples, but I'm I'm wondering about. Yeah, anyway, let us take this one. So, um, so this is the the uh, this nice uh, uh, tutorial of of uh, uh, those. Uh, uh, evolution rules which are kind of visualized nicely and so we have this example of defining custom viewers for certain types of data based on predicates right which is something that Clerk allows us to do on the user side and since we now showed uh, have sh shown this 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 uh, notebook we can look back into this uh, message file that we are spitting and see what we got here all right so a big data structure maybe let us pretty print it uh, all right so i'm just pretty printing it so that it oh but it wouldn't pretty print because it has some things that would not that would not be read by by the the closure reader or so I should so it is a bit slow because of the editor so so I'm kind of a bit stubborn now but I'm looking for a good one that would make things clear for us and um, yeah maybe tablecloth yeah yeah, let us take this one. Okay, sorry for this. So, oh, not this one because it requires stable cloth. Uh, all 
yeah, okay, let, let us take this one, right? So again, I'll take this message file, I'll put it here, I'll print it, print it so that we can see. Oh. We can see this document, this data structure, which is passed to the client, to the browser. So we see that it has this information of what viewers to use, right? I think this information of what viewers to use is not represented exactly as it was defined on the user side, but it is more uh, prepared for the client to use. Um, so maybe you remember there was this phase of decorating the structure with more information about viewers. So I think something is happening there to make it more ready for the use in the browser. But in this uh, example, um, we have these main viewers which are saying, this is just a general result and the value is actually um, something that has this blob ID. So to be viewed, it needs to fetch the relevant value to this, to this blob ID. And then inside the value itself has more information about specific viewers. Uh, oh, sorry. Right, so um, right, so this whole string contains many, many different viewers for different parts of it. Uh, different right? parts of the value, or uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so this value is a certain data structure, and inside it, you see, we have certain viewers. For example, let us look for one of them. Mm -hmm. So this one what is it it is some some expression to be interpreted in the browser by the small closure interpreter that would turn it into closure script runtime that would make it view as needed right and yeah and and maybe maybe we are diving in too much into this i'm not sure um, but uh, the, the point is that the user can specify views mm -hmm. and somehow these views specified by the user are somehow are somehow prepared mm. in more detail to be used in the browser with all the necessary uh, code to be run mm -hmm. to be interpreted in the browser uh -huh. right um, that, yeah. that value is a sorry the edn the thing we're looking at the string is yeah. a what is that that's edn is it is it a, yes okay yeah uh, but it has um is it hmm. it, it has this alias uh, this v slash mm -hmm. is assuming that a certain namespace is available this uh, alias to something that is uh, mm -hmm. that should be available to the interpreter in mm -hmm. the browser side mm -hmm. so we cannot evaluate we cannot read this string here in the back end mm -hmm. only in the browser is it um is that i have actually is that like an edn of parsed code So I it looks so like um, it's a map with the key next journal value, and then it's a tagged um, tagged element of saying that um, when you um, I mean you can have these tagged readers, and so next journal Eden is just saying that if you want to get that value, you then it's of type Eden, so you, then you need to parse the Eden, and so um, oh I see. And I see some really kind of interesting things just kind of looking at that um, that Eden value. So you can see that there's within that there's an external value and mm -hmm. there's a character A on the second line. 
Um, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's also, I saw um, map entry. So if you're- uh, Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So if you, yeah. So map entry, which is um, the, if you kind of um, look through a sequence of on a map, it's a sequence of map entries um, in which uh, has an individual viewer. And it's already, so it's interesting that it's already um, producing or it's already specifying kind of HTML before it sends it to the browser. Um, so it seems like there's some sharing of deciding how to view it between the code that runs in the browser and also in the closure that broadcasts it, I guess, to the browser. So part of it is already kind of um, pre-rendering the or uh, pre-specifying the HTML ahead of time. Interesting. So how do you how do you get that from the map entry? Sorry, I, sorry if we're, I'm just finding this interesting. So I don't know. So, I don't want to slow us down too much yeah i mean if um so like you can see that um so if you search like span.cmt you can see that that's hiccup which is just saying um a span mm -hmm. um with the class. html element with the class right so it's already choosing the html i guess before it gets to the browser and oh, then the I browser see. is um uh -huh. I guess it's probably going through and updating all the different elements with these uh, predetermined, or I guess it's, yeah, it's sending the viewer. So I think, um, I know that um, in previous discussions, Clerk uses Psy to evaluate code in the browser because uh, with ClojureScript, it's hard to kind of get a val. So a lot of um, projects use Psy, which does a good job. And so I assume that that viewer function is being both um, evaluate or read and evaluated by Psy in a Psy environment. Um. Yeah, right. Yeah, so this V alias somehow needs to be bound to some namespace at the Psy environment, right? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah thank you. Please. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I, what's Psy? I gather it's. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Small. Yeah. Is that the closure interpreter that we were talking about earlier? Or is... Yeah. It it's is the this... small closure interpreter. Mm -hmm. I see. And it, it runs in. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, I think it, so it's written in closure and it does a bunch of, uh, does a bunch of work because there's a lot of environments that don't actually have. Um, the compiler is shipped with Clojure, so you can use it for native image. It says GraalVM. You can use it in the browser. You can use it in um, with Node. Uh -huh. So a lot of environments that want to evaluate Clojure code but um, don't already have a compiler available mm -hmm. can use Psy. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That, this, this helps so much. So, um, so going back to the web server namespace, what we saw was this uh, update doc function where we took the result value, this one, and decorate it with some viewer information and broadcasted it to all clients. And then we saw what structure was being broadcast to the client, right? So what we haven't learned yet is this decoration with viewers and mostly the evaluation that gave us this doc. I think we have 13 minutes to the official time. So let us maybe think um, if we should continue a bit and how. And if we wish to make it, yeah, what, what do you think? What would be? Uh, just to, one thing to mention uh, is that we have, in, uh, we're relaunching this group called uh, And the intention was to use the first meeting, which would happen sometime maybe two to three weeks from now, as a, to look at, to look more at clerk. So in considering what we want to do, 
now or whatever, we could also keep that in mind that there's this other time coming up to do more investigation. And it could be something that specific that come, came out of this that we want to look into. In fact, that would be very helpful. Um, should we should we make this session uh, a bit uh, longer, or should we actually conclude soon? What, what are we thinking? Um, um, I'm feeling like I'm learning a lot, so I'm happy to stick around for a little bit longer to kind of continue. But you know, other people may have different uh, time constraints. could do a little bit more yeah but not a, not a whole lot but yeah this has been really interesting and helpful daniel thanks yeah to, to me it is helping a lot too and and I just want to say that what we didn't get to discuss was the usage patterns and workflows and that is what uh, last week in the talk of Faris was so amazing i think different people sharing the flow of of using the tool and and we could hope to to have that kind of discussion too, and maybe Faris has some comments about it. And um, it was a really great discussion. Um, uh, Daniel, was that recorded by any chance? Faris knows. Um, <clears throat> I think the organizer of Closure Asia is going to upload it, uh, so um, can check the. Close your Asia YouTube channel. Awesome. We'll check when it when it's uploaded. Yeah. I'm sure I'll be sure to look at it. Thanks a lot, Harris. Yeah, no problem. Mm. Yeah, so should we continue a bit? Uh and maybe share the screen again and um oh uh, somebody was going to say something, I think maybe. Uh Um, I thought one thing that might be interesting is that, um, so in broadcast, you spit the result to a file and then pretty printed it. I'd be interested to see if you just defined it as a uh, var in the namespace that you're showing oh, via clerk and see if yeah. clerk will just, you know, give us the, uh, give us a view of it. Um, like that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this will work. This is a uh, yeah, but I, yeah. it would be pretty neat if it did. Yeah, great. Let us try. Let us. Yeah, you're so right. It is much better actually than spitting. Yeah, yeah. So I'll now do the hotkey that is showing the namespace. So we did broadcast something to the client, and now let us print this value. Yes, so much easier. So thank you, Adrian. You know, now I'll do things differently in the coming days. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Great, great. No spitting anymore. So, right. Great. So, so right. So we did have these two parts uh, of, I think, this uh, decoration with viewers and the evaluation that was in the main namespace. Maybe should we look into the evaluation? Um, so Daniel, I'm interested, like, you know, you defined this last message inside broadcast, right? Which would itself call broadcast again, you know, because it's, you know, uh, doing the show and the variable. Doesn't this end up in some sort of like loop? Like, you know, like how does this work? Like, you know, that basically the last message that you change inside broadcast will cause it to go to the show again. Uh, it will just, you know, which why, will, why? Because you know it's trying to go back to showing the results. <laughs> you know the the showing of the results is adding a new variable, which is again going to go cause showing of the results. Uh, why? Why would? I'm uh, just I'm just curious as to how. So is it because you know it doesn't get reevaluated? The sec so like when you show a result, right? When you make a change to a variable, you it ends up calling broadcast, which displays it on the browser. 
but then oh. that is itself changing the state of the system because you know it's creating a new def inside so Which i think will... the the reevaluation only happens when he hits the hotkey or when the file is saved in some cases so it doesn't yeah. reevaluate just uh, when when values change or are defined that doesn't necessarily trigger a re uh, another broadcast i see so so is it because it's it's imperative right now that you know only when you do the show it actually does the evaluation but you know it's not watching a file or even when it's watching a file it only updates when the file changes on the file system so um, but I don't, I don't know if he's watching the file, but if you were watching the file, you save it and then it happens once and then um, it, it doesn't get triggered again until you save the file again. I see. I see. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah. And um, and yeah, and at the moment I'm not watching, but, uh, but uh, yes. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, that was this last message and maybe, maybe we can go back to the main clerk uh, namespace. Oh, yeah, I'm again not in the right place. Um, and and maybe we could look into this function. Is it is it kind of is it making sense that we, there are only two main things we haven't learned, and they are both probably big. One is the viewer decoration, and the other is the evaluation and of course there is all the whole client side and the way it works but i mean these are the two main kind of main pieces so yeah maybe let us jump into evaluation um oh. is the viewer decoration happening sorry i might have missed that it's happening yeah. a step below in the update is that right or or is it yes in this update okay, okay we have uh oh well am i might not here. Uh, oh, something is not working about uh, jump to definition. Yeah. Uh, so update uh, talk here. We are taking our result, updating our state, but also doing this kind of decoration, I think, right? Uh -huh. um, which is somehow happening here and there is this describe block function there, there is something yeah a bit a bit detailed happening which is yet to be learned but maybe in the in the little time we could just look a little bit into evaluation i think uh, right uh, so what is eval results oh something is not uh Here is evil resource, All right? So what is our, our input? Our input is two things. One is results last run, which is this, this mapping from hash IDs to values, the cache, right? This is the cache in a sense. And the past doc is just this, in a sense, a sequence of blocks of code, which are still text, right? They are not kind of converted into data structures yet. They are strings, right? And so that is the input. So what is happening now? So we're doing some analysis, right? So maybe maybe let us do uh, the, the trick that Adrian taught us. The, uh, last analyzed talk. Analyzed talk. So I uh, now I'll invoke the clerk show thing, and now we will look into the last analyzed doc. So that is the result of this last analysis. Let us look inside. Right. So uh, we have this graph of dependencies of certain symbols, right? And, and we see, for example, that 
maybe maybe we look into this symbol called eval results so that we can see something familiar. So eval results. So oh sorry, skip it. Uh, Uh, I'm a bit confused. Where are we? Yeah, so sorry, we, it is a big data structure and I got lost. So I'll go to the top again. So what do we have in this graph? The graph is a map. What, is there anything else after the graph? Yes, there are the blocks of code, which, is, which are also kept as part of the analysis, but this time, not just the text, but also the forms. The, forms like after applying the closure reader and okay so this is here too so we have a graph of dependencies that we look into in a moment and we have these blocks and do we have anything after that no so that, that's the structure the analysis gives us our blocks which were passed through the closure reader and a graph of dependencies between closure symbols i think right so i think it is saying that this symbol is depending on these if i understand correctly uh, what about that next i'm sorry i'm having trouble the, yeah so uh, there okay so that the key in this map is the symbol the first one there is that yeah. that function saying it depends on those other symbols yeah those other namespaces or all those and then and then after that that namespace is another key that namespace form yeah that whole thing is a key is that right which uh, would then have dependencies associated with it let us see yes it does have a set of dependencies uh-huh Yes, you're right. Wow. And but I'm I'm trying to see if uh, yeah it, is it making sense, right? So where is this coming from? Hash store in cas uh, store. In, okay, so we have this var defined here. Is it actually depending on freeze, for example? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, it does, right? So it is making sense, I think, right? But are those two equivalent? Like, is the so in the first case that function we're just looking at that's a that's a symbol pointing to a function, uh, uh, and then we have a the next isn't is that a, it's not really a symbol? I guess or is everything this? No, it's not a symbol, right? It's a it's a it's a whole expression. Uh, the thing is a key. I don't know. I'm just confused. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, so right. So not just symbols, also this whole expression. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, right, right. And we have another one like that here. And maybe it makes sense because we need to take care of all top level forms, which are not always bound to symbols. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Thank you. So that's a depends, dependency graph where probably top level forms are uh, marked to be dependent on, on sets of symbols, I think. Mm -hmm. So is, does that mean uh, oh, there is that there's also thing. functions within the name? Like what we're, I was asking somebody, before we were talking about whether there's dependencies on values within the block, within the names, within, sorry. If I have one block that refers to a value find in a previous block would we it's also representing that kind of a dependent let us try yeah actually let us try right we can we can actually try now right cool. so so uh yeah let us create a tiny namespace and let us uh, could you tell me what to write what you're imagining i don't know like uh yeah just you know x is like not yeah and then something there refers to it <clears throat> like that, right? Yeah, exactly. So we just run this 
and uh, oh, where is it? Last, um, last analyze, analyze doc. So here is the analyze doc mm -hmm. for our current uh, shown namespace. So let us, yeah, actually it was a great idea to look nice into this. Small one, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the namespace definition mm -hmm. is depending on a set of things which are part of the closure call, right? Mm -hmm. So let us skip that. This top level form mm -hmm. is depending on adding and on X, as you said, right? That is what you hinted oh, about, cool. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is cool, yeah. And so these are all the dependencies. What are dependents? Mm. So just the opposite direction, right? right. So right. we are expecting to see X here. Yes, so right. X cool. is a dependent of this set of forms that only has this one. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So it is making sense. Yeah, thank you, that, that helped, yeah. Is this um, structure, this graph, a kind of standard idea, or is it a custom mapping? Like, is this something? I don't know. Does that make sense? What I'm asking. Like, is this is this a specific, a data structure specific to to Clerk? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or is it somehow more general, either as an idea or as a uh, something that is generated by a specific tool. I know that it's a general idea. I don't know if they're using a library or doing the analysis themselves, but um, yeah, there are, I think like um, Closure Tools Analyzer will give you um, information that you can use to build graphs like that. And then building mm -hmm. um, dependency graphs is useful for lots of different problems. So it's a dependency graph and the form of it is very recognizable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got I got lost. I'm looking to see if if then uh, yeah, not sure. Yeah, anyway, yeah, great. Um, so yeah. Can you look at the um, the requires for this file? Maybe that would give us a hint as to whether they're using a library or not. Yeah, so I'm jumping to this build graph function. And, mm -hmm. and let us see. Oh, what is that? Interesting. Right, yeah. So there is this uh, general notion of dependency, which is apparently being used here, right? Oh, sorry. Oh, the other um, important namespace that was just, uh, you could just see was uh, closure tools analyzer passes. Mm. Oh. Uh, so so the analyzer will do, it won't necessarily generate that graph for you, but it will uh, It will do a lot of the work for you of like um, giving you the AST and annotating it with extra information about semantically what's happening. Like uh, what are the free variables? Um, oh. Yeah, that, that is great. Yeah, um, we should have a session just about that that one day, right? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's some really, really neat tools that uh, kind of are that other tools built on top of them. And one of them is the tools analyzer. Um, 
does a lot of really cool stuff if you're interested in compilers. Yeah, have you have you used that? Only a little bit. Um, so again, I'm not. It's not the. I'm not a super user of that tool, but I have used it. Yeah, mm, great. Thank you. So, so we uh, may look in uh, look at the clock in a moment again, right? Uh, um, but uh, maybe kind of to, to recap where we were. So we were looking into this. Oh, I'm not in the right place. We were looking to eval results here and were realizing that some analysis of code was taking place and actually figuring out the dependencies between top level forms and symbols. And oh. so maybe we should look a little bit more. Should we continue or should we re, uh, kind of conclude? Uh, uh, what are we? How are we feeling? Um, I'll continue a bit. So, so we got our analyzed doc. And now what is happening? So remember, we had two inputs here, right? One was that just our code. And the other one was this cache the mapping between hash to value from previous runs, right? And now we are taking our analyzed doc and just adding this additional information of the cache and also of new hash values for our new analyzed doc. We were curious about that earlier. Maybe we should look inside this hash function. And then after we are adding this additional information, so we don't only have the analyzed DOF, but also the cache and the new hashes, then we are going to evaluate. So we have two things to learn, right? One is uh, this hashing, and the other is the evaluation. Uh, should we look a bit into the hashing just for a moment? Um, so, all uh, right, because we were curious about what actually is being hashed. So, so we have our graph of dependencies and and we are somehow traveling around it and it looks like some code blocks will be hashed by simply hashing the code. Uh, oh. Actually, the form, which is like not the text, but actually the closure data structure, which is the result of reading the code, right? So some code blocks will be passed through this thing that will just take it like a general hash function and apply it to the form. But we're also relying on the analysis info on the, on the graph, but how? Let us try to see how. Right? Is it? Am I made, making sense? Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So, we are reducing over our graphs, over our graph, and we are reducing over this uh, top topological sort of the graph, which is this kind of ordering by which we can look uh, into all all elements. Actually, let us maybe kind of do a def here so that. Uh, sorry. Uh, so that we can make it concrete. Uh, right, so uh, I'll now invoke another evaluation and then print this. 
thank you for this practice with the deaf. It is so making things so much easier. So that is the topological sort of the graph. So I think it is sorting by dependency. So uh, either uh, we'll have all elements appearing after their dependence, or the other way around, one of these, I'm not sure which one, uh, maybe we could guess by the, yeah, it looks like, it looks like we're beginning with very basic core closure things and then, and then uh, continuing with the more things which are depending upon them. So, right, so the topological sort gives us a sequence of all nodes, which are all our top level forms and all relevant symbols. Well, the ordering is such that if A depends on B, then B will appear before A. And then we are taking care of evaluating them. And it makes sense to evaluate by this ordering, right? Is it, is it good? So we, just, we are just reducing over this sequence now. How are we reducing? So we're beginning with an empty map and we will probably be Evaluate, uh, uh, evolving this map by associating things into it. And this map, we will call it the map of hash, right? The, the mapping from a hash to a value. So we will be associating things into it. So at every step, we're getting K, which is just an element in our sequence. And we are checking. This K, what is the analysis info of this K? Let us, let us check what it means. Right, so let us, let us actually maybe print here. Maybe it will be useful to print the analysis. Maybe let us print both K, K, and the analysis. Oh, sorry. And yeah, and the analysis info of K, right? So I'll invoke it again and see what we got printed. Uh, oh, maybe clean up, sorry. Yeah, so we have pairs like this one. So this is K. K was this symbol in this case. And the analysis info is whatever this it was dependent on. So here it is actually including some things from the class path. Actually, what libraries in the class path it is depending on. So maybe we should look into another K. Uh, so closure print. No, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it looks like um, for jars, it already has a hash file. And so you can see in hash code block, there are three keys and hash and form are kind of the, the major ones. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, and yeah. So yeah. So for jars, it looks like it's just hashing the jar somehow. And for code, it's just using the form of the perfect. code. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You figure it out. Yes. Yeah. So, so if the analysis info does, I mean, when, when would we not get this if, oh, okay. Okay, so. So I assume for uh, comments, it doesn't include it in the hash. So if you just add a top level comment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so for most interesting part of our code, it will have an analysis, the analysis info, and then it will associate with our hash ma map the result of hashing this code block, which is okay. So hashing is always just hashing over the code, nothing more than that, right? Um, great, great. So 
uh, is it making sense? Um, we just got a map of hashes from forms to, sorry, from forms to their hashes, right? Um, so that is that. And great, great. Is this the hash we saw way back before linking uh, uh, ID to a result? Oh, now I realize that I was wrong. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, there are also the depths. I skipped that. Okay, okay. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah, so, so not only the form affects the hash, but also the depths. And that is why it makes sense to go into the analysis info. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we are taking the hashes of the dependencies and relying on them. And that is why we need to do that in order in this topological sort, where whenever we take a form, and need to associate a hash to it, we need to take into account the hashes of all things it is depending on. Mm -hmm. So we need to have them already in our map, right? So that is why we are going in order. You, you, yeah, sorry for uh, confusion, uh, but you were saying something, sorry. I know that's helpful. I was just, my, um, I guess what I was wondering was in, this, in a very simple case, well, let's let's say that tiny namespace we created yeah. before, and you change the twelve to a fourteen, so not change the dependency even. Yeah. Uh, if at that point the hash that's generated would be different, right? Yes, and maybe uh, more uh, interesting is that if we change this, that would that would also cause it to be different. That was called would cause not only uh, the hash of the X symbol to change, but also the hash of this form to change right. because it relies on everything it is dependent on. Okay, and right. then that would produce a, a cache miss because... Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you, yes, yes. Yeah, great, so, 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 yeah. Uh, so that was this look into hashing and we are back in the main namespace and that is what we got we began sorry with our analyze doc and computed the hashes based on this analysis of dependencies and we are associating these hashes to our doc and we are also associating the existing cache and it looks like now we have all the necessary information for evaluation right we have our code actually as form after being after passing through the reader we have the hashes that would determine which things should be re-evaluated due to cache miss and we have the cache, right? Yeah, so great. So now we can go to the evaluation function and let us maybe jump into it just for a moment. Oh, again, it is not working. Uh, uh, oh. uh, well, analyze block. So here is the evaluation function. Um, which is getting this um, analyzed doc that contains the hashes and the blocks of code. And also the cache, I think. Yeah. And yeah, and maybe I'm not sure if we have time to dive into this, but maybe we 
kind of already have an expectation of what should be happening, right? And that is only evaluating the parts that need to be reevaluated and then updating the, the cache accordingly, I guess, right? And um, yeah, and here's the cache, the blob to result. Yeah, but maybe I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we should stop now and, and um, yeah, let, let us maybe think for a moment about the time, right? And about what we are hoping to do. Maybe one thing we could do is to at least conclude and try to say in a few sentences what we were seeing. Um, if it makes sense, or what, what would be useful? Yeah, maybe just like a recap of like the, I don't know, top, top insights or whatever. What's everyone's like coolest thing to take away or something? Uh, so um, I think uh, to me, one way that I learned is this way of learning uh, that kind of Adrian encouraged me to do by inserting a def that actually mattered so much for the exploration, just being able to capture a value and print it. And, uh, and then I think we just went through some of, of the kind of complex pieces of technology that, that are there. And maybe we have some map of how they are organized uh, kind, kind of in relation to each other, where we saw the hashing, we saw there is a map of cache, we saw there is a main evaluation function that we haven't learned yet and those viewers that we haven't learned yet. And we saw them somehow flowing between the main entry points. And, and, and I, maybe we could try to think, I think maybe if this could be continued somehow and maybe focused on one of those parts. Um, 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 yeah. I was pretty impressed how easy it was to kind of follow what um, the the code that they had, and also just the the show function was really cool because it's just like read the val and hmm. print. Well, it's not print, but it like updates the view, so it's like it's very close to the REPL where it's like read a val show, and uh, it was almost uh, scary how straightforward it was. Yeah. Yeah, it's nicely written for sure. If you like debugging that way, Daniel, I'll share a library. There's a library called Scope Capture that I use sometimes. That's um, really, really nice. Like it's it's easy if you just have like one variable, but if you're ever trying to capture like a whole sort of like environment um, that's being called. So you want like, if you want to save like multiple things, you want to save like basically take like a snapshot of the state at a, at a certain point. That's kind of what it's for. It's a really cool library that I use for debugging sometimes. Um, it's like very similar kind of like workflow to that, that what we were doing. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's, yeah, totally agree with you, Adrian. It's really nicely, really nicely done library. Oh, thank you, thank you. I need that and I hope so, to learn. Daniel, one other th thought comes to mind. I know you're exploring portal, right? Like we could, and you know, like, this thing has a whole bunch of atoms we want to evaluate. It would be nice to like use portal to debug or see, uh, you know, what clerk is doing like in its state. Um, so it would like put portal to good use, like, you know, uh, just a thought, but you know, portal is like uh, very powerful when it's evaluating atoms and looking at data structures. And it would be really nice to see portals use case here too like you know if, if 
if nothing else, like, it would be awesome. That would be amazing, yeah. Actually, I'm curious, so would that just be a matter of like, I haven't used portal that much, but you'd have to include, you have to add the dependency to the namespace you're using it in, is that right? And then you would, or is there a shorter, like a less invasive? Because you, you need that tap method, right? So you have to have that available. Is that right? If like, if instead of saying def last or whatever, you could use tap there. Is that, would that be the general idea? Uh, portal has, uh, it, we could say it has one main entry point, which is a submit function. Whenever you call that with a value, you submit that value and it is somehow being viewed in the clerk view. And tap is one, one, way, one kind of ergonomics that you could wrap this submit with. But it is your choice how you're submitting things, if it makes sense. Okay. Um, I noticed that you were using Emacs and the CIDR result, which would kind of preprint. I noticed that for large data structures that kind of like were just like one key or one value can take up the whole screen. Um, CIDR has CIDR inspect. And so if you haven't checked that out, it's um, it's really awesome. It's like a hidden feature that does a lot. So um, I wouldn't, it's a, it, it takes some while because the key bindings aren't obvious, but uh, it is very useful for kind of those large data structures. Oh, that's super. Yeah, I always struggle with that. Wow, thank you. But, but then one thing I'm wondering about with inspect is that uh, is it, uh, it is actually not looking like the printed structure. It is not using the closure notation of curly braces, right? But it, it is looking a bit differently, right? If, and then I'm yeah. kind of confused. Uh, so it is like a new, new visual language, but you're saying it is worth it. Uh, especially when things are big, right? Yeah, I mean, I found it useful. I mean, in some cases too, where you have such a large data structure that it, uh, you just like, it'll kind of take over the, um, it'll kind of like pause and kind of root, uh, slow down your workflow because it takes so long to print the whole thing. And it also works with um, cyclical data structures. I don't know if you've ever accidentally print, tried to print a, uh, data structure with like an atom that refers back to stuff it can, can just like um, kind of get lost in itself so it does it it does it kind of one level at a time so you can um, in fact you can print out infinite lazy sequences and it'll kind of it won't um, take over your REPL so it has um, yeah for the medium to large size I found it really useful fantastic yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, does anyone else have any like last thoughts or comments or whatever? I think, yeah, this is really interesting for me. So thanks, Daniel. Um, can like keep an eye on the zoo loop, I guess, for the recording and or announcements about future ones. We'll probably do something like this. I don't know what the schedule is, but every once in a while, at least. Uh, just a word about uh, that Shifu meeting I met, mentioned earlier, um, kind of relaunching these meetings, which happened pretty regularly yeah. last year. Uh, and the first session we thought about was uh, on clerk as well. And specifically, I think we were gonna try to see whether we could mess with the viewer, these custom viewers to see if we could render um, a tech ML data set in a way that's a bit more optimal. Uh, yeah, when, I, cool. when I've used Clerk, that's one of the things I've kind of struggled with a bit, um, uh, how it renders those data sets. Uh, so, and after this, I was kind of wanted to see this because I wanted to see like where, well, I 
didn't understand much of the flow in Clerk, so this really helped. But also, I was kind of wondering whether it could help shape that session. And it seems to me, I don't know if you guys agree with it, the viewers is one area where I'd like to learn a lot more about what's going on. And so the current scope of that proposed session seems good. Uh, but I, yeah, does that sound interesting to any of you guys here? Like a session kind of looking more into playing around, understanding those viewers more specifically, and maybe even you trying to make one or adjust, you know, influence how Clerk renders a data set. Does that seem like an interesting topic? So Ethan, I'd be really interested for one, like, you know, I don't know how well it does at like rendering bigger data sets. Like the, I know like the Vega thing, it it expects us to like put the, the whole, for some reason, like when the data got bigger, clerk got slower, like, you know, because of the mm -hmm. way it, it's very, I don't know, maybe how I was giving it data, but it mm -hmm. got really slow, but I'd be really interested. And uh you know the tech ml data sets generally you tend to deal with bigger data sets so i'd be really interested on in how you do the viewers for those yeah yeah and i mean some of the problems i encountered were just even you know where i had a set of you know i mean some of them are really basic like it um doesn't necessarily show the the column names and if you have a lots of columns you don't if the width of each column is so narrow that you know so it's just like rendering you know just very ergonomic rendering stuff um, as well as like uh, performance over bigger data sets um, so there's a lot to explore there yeah and you know i mean because it's interactive like tables especially like you know you can't sort them you can't filter them it would be nice to like start building like some of the other tools, like, you know, I use Databricks and their notebooks on a regular basis. Mm. And they like, you know, let you, once you show up a table, then, you know, you can from that table derive other views, like visually, not, not through, but it would be nice to see something like that. Like, you know, you can apply a filter straight on the table, like an Excel yeah. sheet. And it would be really nice to just like filter them out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm really interested in that, that kind of like, you know, exploration kind of uh, workflow. Like once you get your base data set where you don't have to constantly keep changing keep code to display yeah. data. Yeah, nice. Okay, so then I, I will, uh, you know, try to define that topic a bit and announce it soon. So look out for that. Um, awesome. Is it okay with everybody to make this recording public or maybe should we edit some parts out because it was a bit confused? What, what do you think? Because I know others were a bit interested in this session. Uh, anyway, it will take a couple of days be before we upload anything. So if there was anything you think that shouldn't be made public, that please tell me and I will edit it out. <laughs> Thanks. Sounds good to me. Okay. Yeah, I guess. So I guess we'll wrap up there but uh yeah let us know i guess i don't keep an eye on probably i don't know where's the best place the community is kind of like spread out across zulip slack and uh closureverse but we kind of like post stuff in all, all of those places so we'll uh try to announce what's going on next and probably yeah when the recording comes out if anyone wants to follow along after uh can do that but uh, uh yeah i guess we'll leave it there so yeah have a nice weekend everyone Thank you so much. This is a really great session. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, thank oh, you cool. for organizing. Thank you. Thanks.